Does everybody want to move forward? We'll fill up the first two rows. Hey, Wade. How are you? Yeah, it feels like a very intimate audience here, so, uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Well, thank you all for uh, taking the time to come to Summit this week. Um, a lot of good content out there, obviously a lot of good uh, presentations. So, um, you know, I feel pretty privileged today to have uh, Mark here join us, and, and he'll introduce himself here in a minute. But you know, everyone's aware of, obviously, the disruption caused by data that's going on in the energy space, whether it's you know, oil and gas, power and utilities. Um, and this, what, what Mark's going to talk about today is actually, you know, a data journey from, you know, one of our uh, customers in, in Centrica and British Gas and, you know, a group that was ultimately uh, spun out of the innovation lab there into its own entity in, in IO Tahoe. So what you'll learn about is essentially some of the challenges um, that, uh, you know, Centrica and some other companies were having around, around data and ultimately how, you know, Mark and, and the team from what's now IO Tahu uh, helped solve some of those challenges, uh, you know, building technology on top of the Hortonworks data platform. Um, and so, you know, you'll gain some, some pretty good insight around specific use cases, um, you know, how IO Tahu is helping um, Centrica and other customers solve those. And, uh, and then obviously we'll open it up for questions after that. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce Mark Miller, Chief Product Officer for IHO Tahoe, which um, incidentally soon will be one of our partners. Um, and uh, so that's, that's in progress today. So uh, with that being said, Mark, I'll turn it over to you, man. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, nice to see so many of you here today. Am I on? Uh, it's nice to see so many of you here today. Um, my name is Mark Miller. Before I get into who and what I am and so on and so forth, let me introduce our parent company, which we just, as Kenneth mentioned, we've spun out. Um, it's kind of somewhat obligatory. Uh, Centrica actually has 28 million customers, primarily in the UK and the US, uh, under Direct Energy, uh, Ireland, um, some in Australia. And we've started looking at technology and applying that in the energy business whether it's in the exploration and plant uh, or in the distributed energy part of our business, as well as the consumer side of our business. Um, and as part of that, as Kenneth mentioned, we started seeing an explosion of data. So what I'm going to take you through is a little bit of the journey that we went on, um, which Kenneth has heard a number of times already. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I'm going to explain how we decided to actually take the tool set and the capability that we created and put it out onto the commercial market. And then I'm going to talk about how that tool set is actually enabled um, multiple domains, as I call it, because it's not necessarily departments necessarily or business units within Centrica um, in terms of business outcomes. So I, I'm not going to necessarily spend huge amounts of time talking about underlying technology, but more about what it's enabled us to get to. Um, one of the things that we're taking to market as IHO Tahoe is the ability to have that tool set to get to a known data state on the data lake, but we also have a huge data science capability within Centrica, and we're going to utilize that in terms of going to market as well. But let me go through the, the story. So this is Centrica, uh, 1.5 billion profit, so it's not a small company, um, quite a number of people, um, lots of processes, procedures, too many of them, quite frankly, um, and uh, uh, we have started to create things like Hive, Panoramic Power, which are also subsidiaries, a bit like IHO Tahoe. Um, Hive is about connected homes, smart homes, um, Panoramic Power is about sensorizing uh, electric electricity grids and so on. Uh, and there are a number of others that are in the pipeline that I can't talk about yet, but that, that's the kind of innovation and uh, uh, creativity that's started to come into Centrica, which is a 200-year-old company, just so you know. So let me tell you about uh, creating a new operational model for data management, as I call it. Um, I'll go through the story first um, of data management and data science and how that came about in Centrica to create Iho Tahoe. Yes, that is a picture of the lake up north from here, which I still haven't been to yet, but I'm hoping to one day. And in case you're wondering, yes, I'm part British and I'm part American, so I have a screwed up accent, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> so, 
how did we start? So we actually started by having a challenge put to the then CIO of buying 10 million pounds worth, yes, pounds, it's an odd currency, but it still exists, um, of Teradata. Um, I think it was four months later than when we bought 10 million pounds of Teradata previously, and it was getting to the point where they didn't want to spend 10 million pounds every quarter. Um, probably a very un, you know, normal story that you've all come across. So th the challenge actually was kind of interesting in terms of how it came about. Um, the CIO at the time had connections with local universities. They started bringing in interns and, and, and graduates and postgraduates. And they actually created a cluster using uh, Raspberry Pis. That was the first Hadoop cluster in Centrica, was a uh, Raspberry Pis. And then they borrowed and stole whatever laptops and hardware they could and built another bigger Hadoop cluster. Um, and the reason I mention how that came about is because it created a, a bottom-up, creative, innovative, kind of you know, intern, graduate, professional interaction that was essentially the birthplace of where data science actually started in Centrica. And where what actually started was the data science part, not the data lake part. The data lake came about because he was searching for an alternative to Teradata and said, oh, let me use this data lake to make that happen. And of course, now we sit on 100 nodes plus, uh, or a couple of hundred nodes uh, of uh, Hadoop clusters. So that's kind of how the data science capability started. And, and you know, it, it's now grown to 35, 40 plus people um, from all walks of life. Um, we're connected with four different universities. Um, we have PhDs. Um, we have people come in on a temporary basis because they just want to work with our data science team. So it's very interactive, very collaborative, very open, much too open for Centrica corporate. Um, in terms of the things that we talk about, including these slides here, by the way. Um, they don't like this kind of stuff being shared, but I'm going to share it anyway. Um, so that's how I kind of got into, into the business of, uh, of getting into a data lake. We've now got to the point where we go to each business and we use this scorecard to understand where they're at. So I have an example where North America Homes for Direct Energy um, they've, they pay a, a sum of money, I won't say how much, but it's quite considerable, um, to Palantir to get the KPIs and the reports that they want. Um, they tried to do a data lake, but didn't succeed. And there are different reasons why people don't succeed. It's not always tools. It's sometimes culture. They don't have the right people. But you probably all know this story. But the culture of wanting to do self-service, of involving the business owners of the data, the business analysts, and have that self-service capability is a different mindset. Bringing that data science kind of capability into your organization is a different mindset. It does require change management. It's not just straight, and that's why data culture is on them. So we do this kind of mapping, and um, one of our principal data scientists is actually I pity him somewhat. He's on his way to Houston for a secondment to set up the data science team in North America because the data science team in North America is minimal. And realistically, that's where the value came from. You heard this morning in the keynote, that's where the value of, of, of business outcomes actually comes from. We kind of have understood that from day one. And that's where our focus has actually been. Everything else is kind of trying to help us get there. Um, so we created a data science team. These are all the different places that we are doing it right now. Um, and you know, it, it really is the, how should I put it? The artiste of data. Um, artiste, is that American? Probably not. Anyway, I get confused between English and American, I'm sorry. Um, but they're artists, so you think of them as having a data as their palette of paint. They look at the data in a different way than you and I. Well, maybe not you, but certainly I. And in some respects, they are the ones that bring out the, the relationships, the, it, you know, the connections of data, the insights that actually matter to business. 
Um, and sometimes they come up with things that you think, and? Um, and sometimes, and unfortunately, you have to do a number of those, quite a number of those, before you hit upon one that actually says, ah, yes, I know how to make a difference here. And I'll show you in a minute about business outcomes, what that is. Um, as you see down here, there's a lot of, you know, PhDs, MS, you know, graduate schemes, apprentices, domain expertise. And as part of that, the data science techniques started helping create an IHO Taho capability. And I'll tell you what IHO Taho is in a minute. Um, that kind of sprang out of the data science as a necessity. You heard earlier that they spent 80% of their time cleaning data, preparing data, getting it to the point where they actually need it. That's kind of how and why IHO Taho exists. So, what is IO Tahoe? So, IO Tahoe was um, created at the beginning of this year um, after a probably 18 month journey of creating a tool set internally to Centrica um, that was basically used to do smart data discovery for data lake projects within Centrica. We, as of last month, bought a company called Rocket Astra who we discovered through uh, some analyst friends of ours have a very similar technology in terms of smart data discovery, but they actually do it on relational databases. So they look at multiple databases and try to understand the relationships between those databases. We look at data lakes and try to understand the relationships of the data in there. So we created the, the company, um, and now we're looking to, um, or already started going to, to market, um, with that smart data discovery capability. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in a second. So the reason I call it a creating a new operational model for data management is that on the underpinning all of your data prep, all of your data quality, data analytics, data science, AI, deep learning, you need to have an operating system of data that is good known data. Um, otherwise, you have garbage in and garbage out. And you can't have good business outcomes with bad data, with data that is not fully understood, not fully understood in terms of relationships as well as metadata definition. So this isn't just about metadata management before you start getting bored, um, as I would be. Um, so what it is, what is it solving? It's taking, and you've heard me talk about the increase of data, you're all aware of that, obviously, um, and moving it rather than from a data discovery, manual, subject matter expert, time consuming, um, and I'll give you an example, the, another North American business um, for North America, Homes, which is the consumer side of direct energy, um, they spent, uh, I think it's about six months trying to make sense of their data lake. Um, we went in with our tool and we did it in six weeks. Probably less actually, but let's call it six weeks. So it's much, much faster, and no teams of people, um, no expertise required in terms of data engineers, data mappers, data validators. You do need some experience and knowledge of the business. You can't operate in a vacuum. Um, to be able to basically get to the point where you understand your data so you can actually do some business outcomes that ultimately result in revenue, revenue assurance, as I call it, or profit. And in the energy business, as most of you probably are related to the energy business here, revenue assurance is a big thing. Or if it isn't, maybe we should talk. <laughs> so what is IO Taha? We are essentially relationships auto-discovered. Um, so the alternative is to do it manually. What we're not is uh, big data management, data quality, business glossary. Now our tool capability has you know, adaptive ingestion, it has some metadata management, we are getting, it's close to a, 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 a data glossary, uh, a data catalog, sorry, um, and it has governance throughout the, the data pipe. So it does a lot of those things, but that's not where our core intellectual property lies, it lies in discovering those relationships. So at a nutshell, we build the data lake, we have the adaptive ingestion, um, which, to be fair, is not our strongest point, but we do have to suck in huge amounts of data. Somebody asked me earlier. 
Um, it was about, I think it was teradata, asking me strangely. Uh, it was about 10 teradata, terabytes worth of data every day. That's the delta that goes into the lake. Um, and uh, it's growing. That was uh, a little while ago. We then do the data discovery of that data. So we, each time it gets updated, a new column was added in SAP or some other business application, we automatically detect it and ingest it in. By 7.30 every morning, that data has to be ready for business use. We then do the customer fingerprinting, as we call it, or data discovery, where we literally go through all of the data, every single piece, look at the content and create relationships that either are valid or not, and we actually go through metadata crowdsourcing, so it goes through a machine learning loop with a human validation in, in there to understand whether this relationship is uh, a, a relationship or not. So we have roles and users, so multiple roles have to approve this particular relationship before it becomes a reality in the business. And, and that's where the governance comes in at the bottom. Um, we have obviously the metadata management. It's pretty close to a, 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 the reason I don't call it a data catalog, it doesn't have some of the fancy things a data catalog application software does that is also on the market. And that's not really what we're trying to push into, into the market. And ultimately, the purpose of this is to get it out into um, you know, data knowledge queries that data science can use. And because we have and you'll see in a minute when I go through the business outcomes, a lot of expertise in different domains, whether it's smart meters, IoT, um, procurement, various different areas. We're actually packaging that up. Um, think of it as applied DSX, um, to use the keynote uh, equivalent of IBM. So we've done this. We've produced the metrics. We've gone through the pain of having to come up with various different data science hypotheses and throwing them away and then coming back and saying, yes, okay, this one's the right one, and packaging that up so that those people that have smart meters that want to do these different kind of business domain outcomes get that leg up from us. So let me talk a little bit about the business outcomes. Um, so the first one uh, is uh, actually in Holland, believe it or not. Um, Holland is a small country in Europe, for those that don't know. Um, cathodic protection is basically about protecting electricity um, uh, cables. And there's about 15,000 of them spread across the Netherlands in various different fields, quite often run over by tractors and farmers and so on. And uh, right now, they have engineers that go and look at these pipes every now and then, when they can, in overtime, um, to monitor whether they're still doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and what we're actually doing is with a company that I mentioned at the very beginning called Panoramic Power, is we're going to sensorize each one of these pipes, which essentially is a classic IoT. So it's going to measure GPS, where is it? It's going to measure the electricity to see whether it's still doing what it's supposed to do. It's going to measure um, uh, humidity and ultimately all sorts of other factors. Um, and we're collecting that data into, into uh, the data lake um, using NiFi in this particular case. And what we're doing is using IO Tahoe to get it to a known state of what we're doing. So it, you know, again, you need that capability. And what they're actually doing um, by doing this is that originally they just wanted to kind of do a better maintenance. Now they're doing predictive maintenance. So they know when to send somebody out. They know where to go. They actually want to apply the same kind of methodology to um, uh, cable, uh, cable protectors. So at the moment, they have these mobile cable protectors because it's very expensive. They have to go from cable to cable to cable. They just want to instrument all of their cables, collect all the data, again, using very low cost, um, high volume sensors in, in each uh, cable to then bring it in and then actually using predictive analytics, um, create a model where they only send people when they need to send them and they know ahead of time when and how to send them. The next case is uh, revenue assurance. This is uh, British gas. Um, so what we did here is we first did digital transformation. So we actually gave our engineers 
um, little devices that actually allowed them to interact with the customer directly and we got the information very quickly, which is what those three screens are there. They actually, the middle screen, although you can partially see it, actually entices that engineers to try and upsell appliance insurance or some other service that British Gas offers. Uh, British Gas in the UK happens to be the, the 12th largest insurance provider, uh, as well as a energy supplier. Um, so, and the insurance is primarily on boilers, appliances, whatever we can find and think of. So once we enabled our engineers to do this and get the information, we started collecting that information. Um, and we started applying data science to the information that we've got. And we got, and I had to rub out some of the numbers here, so I'm gonna just verbally say them. But there was about um, 180,000, uh, th these are what's called broken promises. So this is when an engineer doesn't turn up to your house, it's called a broken promise. Um, believe it or not, this happens, where engineers don't turn up to your house when they're supposed to. And as a broken promise, British Gas actually hands, has to hand out uh, a compensatory amount of money, depending on what it is. So out of that 180,000 broken promises, um, sorry, appointments, there was about 18,000 that were broken. And that meant we had paid out about 1.8 million pounds. Well, after we did some of the, the analytics, and it's very hard to see here, but basically we collected all the information about broken promises, where they are, who they were, and they did two things. One, they tried to make it better, so we actually had a higher number of appointments and a lower number of broken appointments because they tried to fix whatever was broken there. Um, but the amount that they actually paid out because they changed the for formula of payout dropped to 300K. So 1.5 million pounds from 2015 to 2016 went straight to the bottom line. That's real. It's not, it's not made up, it's real stuff. So this happens all the time. One other one which is not on here, um, it's uh, called Free Saturday and Sunday. So British Gas actually run still TV adverts offering free electricity and energy, I think it's electricity rather than gas, for Saturday and Sunday. Because by collecting with the smart data information, they realized that most of the energy consumption on the weekends was in the evenings. Don't ask me why, but it is. They are, people are out during the day doing stuff, come home in the evenings, shoots up. Producing energy in the evenings is actually more expensive. So they gave away free Saturday and Sunday, sounds like a great offer to the consumer, and it changed the distribution of the energy from evening to during the day, and it lowered the peak as well. What that meant is that British Gas saved two million pounds in energy consumption, straight to the bottom line. Picture doesn't make much sense without the numbers, but hey. <laughs> I was told by corporate to take the numbers out, sorry. So here's another one that actually is not related to um, any Centrica business. This was actually done for a, um, what should I call them, a broadband media provider. Um, very well known, at least in the UK and Europe. Um, basically, they had a problem where they have 41,000 of these cable boxes in the streets. You probably see them as you drive around. There's cable boxes in the street. Uh, I actually noticed around driving around here, they seem to have more of them than, than Europe does. I don't know what you stick in them, but there's, there's a lot of these boxes. And this actually applies pretty much to all of them. Um, this particular customer had a problem of not knowing what electricity those boxes were consuming. So the electricity provider we're giving them a fixed bill and saying, hey, I want my, uh, I'll give it a number, four or five million, 4.5 million, let's call it that, pounds for the electricity you're consuming in those cable boxes. This supplier, this cable media company had no idea what they were consuming. So we instrumented it using panoramic power to measure the electricity. And what actually happened is with that ingestion of that data, and actually you know, cleaning that data up, getting it, discovering relationships, marrying it up with location, customers, um, started measuring humidity um, uh, and, um, and temperature, we actually started to understand when those boxes would fail, when those things would start going wrong. 
their previous, uh, you'll, you'll find this funny, maybe not, but um, the previous way that they, just, they could find out whether their box was actually down is by having three or more calls in the same street or area. That's how they triangulated whether the cable box was down or not. So what they are now able to do is with that is they are able to basically change um, when to send an engineer because they're doing predictive maintenance, which changes how the customer perceives them. They retain customers, they get more customers because the customer experience is better, the, the reliability is better, and they get um, more insight as to um, what those customers are doing as well, just by measuring the electricity, and I'll show you in a minute what that means. And that insight um, allows them to provide a better service, which ultimately means more revenue. What they're currently looking at is that almost all of these boxes, and I did think about showing you a box, but it looked kind of, I don't know, Tonka toys, if you know what that means. Um, they all have batteries in them, right? So those batteries actually get charged up. Actually, 41,000 of those could be a very decent virtual power plant off-grid. So they could use that uh, battery power in those 41,000 boxes to actually supply energy back to their own boxes and their own uh, connect. So the next one is um, connected homes. So this is a, uh, a spin-off of uh, Centrica um, under the hive. Um, and what this basically, this is about smart homes. So what we primarily did here is we looked at um, some protect, especially you know, specific elements that, that we had <coughs> um, connected. Okay. Um, let me just keep talking without, uh, without a slide. What you would have seen next is a kind of map of smart homes, smart businesses that contribute energy and other things that take away energy away. And basically, we um, looked at some of those smart meters, smart boilers, smart appliances, and understanding what we're collecting. Um, and we basically, using iHotel on top of the data lake, got a better insight of what that, that data is. Um, and basically, we are actually looking to, because some of these smart homes, um, not that this is off-putting by any means, some of these smart homes are um, looking at um, providing energy to the grid as well as taking energy from the grid. Um, so what they're actually looking at is you know, a vision for a virtual power plant so that these consumers that are currently consuming energy, as smart homes, will start providing energy. Uh, and they're actually looking at, and we actually have a, a pilot uh, in a part of the UK um, using blockchain technology to provide those virtual plant, uh, power plant, you know, consumers being providers, suppliers. Not quite sure what happened to this slide, but okay. Um, Come dark again. Okay. Um, <laughs> Excuse me for a second. Okay. What we also did with collecting all this information, and you can barely see it, but what we actually did is got very sophisticated with profiling customers. So if you look at each one of those lines, and actually somebody looked at the, pointed out, I think, the, the black person, um, that one of those lines is probably your cable box because it's at a certain consumption rate and you could understand where it is. Centrica profiles its customers to the nth degree and provides tariffs and capability to that using big data, using this information, getting that information off, and providing uh, that to customers. What, that does, what does that mean? It means you can get more customers because you're providing offers and you know, tariffs that are specific to them and retaining the ones that you have because you're giving them the best deal that you can give. So this is, I think uh, John talked earlier today 
about profiling the customer based on sentiment using calls, this is the centric way of profiling those customers. It's using smart meters every 10 minutes. They're, they're about to do it every second uh, to understand what it is that they're actually consuming and profiling them on that basis. There's an added complication to that because GDPR, which is a regulation in Europe, about to come in place by May 2018, um, which will apply to American companies operating there as well, actually tells you you have to tell your customers what and how you're profiling. So it'd be interesting to explain to them how we do it. So, <clears throat> so then we, we build up you know, a, a picture of what the customer does and how they consume uh, on an individual basis. Uh, and ultimately, that leads to, to revenue. Where I got confused a minute ago when my slides went blank was this slide here, which is about virtual power plant, which I already covered. And I'm pretty much at the end of my time. So I'll try and get one last one in, which is modeling process safety. So this is on exploration and plant. So we have oil rigs and gas rigs all around the, the, the country and the world. Um, and this is about the safety process. So this is using the bow tie model of before an event and after event, managing it. And going through that model, basically, you have to collect all the information from the various different uh, sources of within the, the rigs and so on um, before the event. And what you're trying to do is preventative at that point and have red, amber, green rag statuses for all of those different barriers within the, within the gas and exploration plant. And again, we collect that all into Data Lake, use IATAR to understand the relationships between all the different pieces. I think John earlier talked about connections between a pipe and a turbine or something, as we remember rightly. Um, we kind of do that automatically using IATAR. And based on that, data science then looks at what are the trends and correlations that we're doing on top of that barrier model, which is primarily there to be used in case an event happens. The more it goes to the right and it goes from pr protective rather than preventative, the more it costs the business. And most businesses have to set aside something on their balance sheet of what it's going to cost when they have an emergency event like this. You know, and ultimately, having more predictive understanding of what that is, how that is, changes your financial model of your business. And this is kind of a mock-up of what it would look like. Um, it looks innocuous, it looks uh, yeah, but there is data behind this, a lot of business rules, a lot of rules about what turns something to um, you know, red, amber, and green. I'm probably out of time, but this is procurement. It's a little bit more vertical. It's really quite straightforward. Uh, my procurement team has no idea how many suppliers it has. He has apparently 10,000 or so, but it, he told me that it, at the board level, he was asked how many suppliers. He couldn't actually give a number because it goes across all the brands. He, he wanted to add and has added modern slavery and uh, Dun & Bradstreet risk management data to the lake. We, with the IATAR, married that all up. And so now he has an understanding of what his ethical suppliers are and his risky suppliers are. You kind of know what the impact of that is. It means you don't lose money on risky suppliers and you don't risk your brand and your reputation on unethical suppliers. All that equates to revenue and profit. And that's it. Any questions? Go ahead. Ah. Um, yeah. Can you just repeat the question? So just a quick question. You mentioned blockchain. So I'm just curious how you're using blockchain today uh, for the use case you, I think it was the, the virtual power plants, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it, it, we're using it as a, a trusted way of getting a consumer to be a supplier to payments. I, that's all I can say at the moment, because it's, I probably shouldn't have mentioned it at all. So. <laughs> But it's, it's really about uh, payment of, of it's a, it's a, if you think of Bitcoin, which is based on blockchain, this is a, a, a supplier, a mass supplier way of, if you have wind and solar people, people have wind and solar providing electricity to the grid, this is a payment methodology that we've, we're currently trialing in a, in a county in, in the UK. Um, so any other questions?
I must have been crystal clear. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it.